The digestive system. Our digestive system is a combination of mechanical and chemical actions. Imagine putting your food in a petri dish, chopping it up and exposing it to a bunch of chemicals and microbes. Can you imagine what it would look like in the end? This is what the digestive system does. Mouth. The journey down the alimentary canal begins in the mouth. Here, the food is broken down into smaller chewable pieces. Chewing breaks the food into pieces while the saliva mixes with food to begin the process of breaking it down into a form your body can absorb and use. Rolling action of the tongue and secretion of saliva rolls food into a bolus. The saliva contains water, electrolytes, antibacterial components and enzymes such as the amylase. Amylase converts carbohydrates into sugars. Throat The throat is the region where the mouth cavity and the nasal passages join. Swallowing pushes the food through the throat, or pharynx, and into the esophagus. An important function of the throat is that it prevents the food from entering into the trachea, more commonly known as the windpipe. When the food enters our throat, the larynx, or our voice box, closes. This results in epiglottis covering the entrance of the trachea, or windpipe. The epiglottis is a flap of tissue. Esophagus now that the food has reached the esophagus, a wave of smooth muscle contractions occurs, pushing the food into the stomach. These smooth muscle movements are called peristalsis. The importance of sphincter muscles. Three types of sphincter muscles help in the digestive system. Here, at the junction of the esophagus and the stomach, is a thick ring of circular, smooth muscle that prevents the movement of food pass from esophagus into the stomach. It is called the esophageal sphincter. Another sphincter muscle, the pyloric sphincter directs the passage of food from the stomach into the intestine. The third sphincter muscle surrounds the anus, stomach. Most of us eat our food in a matter of minutes, but digesting it can take hours. One of the important functions of our stomach is to store food until it is digested. Food can be stored here for two to six hours. It also kills the microorganisms we consume unconsciously, along with our food, and begins the digestion of the proteins we took in our diet. The stomach secretes gastric juice, hydrochloric acid, water, mucus, pepsin, and renin that continue the process of breaking down the food. Pepsin is secreted as pepsinogen by cells in the gastric glands that are present in the deep folds of the stomach lining. Other cells in the gastric glands produce hydrochloric acid, which has a pH balance between 1 and 3. The low pH helps convert pepsinogen to pepsin and is also the right pH for pepsin's enzymatic action. Hydrochloric acid, or HCl, also helps break the bonds holding the ingested contents together. The breakdown of these food contents exposes more surface area to the action of pepsin and later to the other digestive enzymes in the small intestine. Mucus secreted by the stomach lines the walls of the stomach and protects them from being digested by HCl and pepsin. If this coating is eroded at some place of the stomach, for instance by the attack of bacteria Helicobacter pylori, it can cause an ulcer. Contractions of the smooth muscles in the walls of the stomach roll around its contents, mixing partly digested food with enzymes and acids. This acidic, fluid mixture of gastric juice is called chyme. Peristaltic movements of the stomach walls push chyme towards the end of the stomach. These waves of peristalsis cause the pyloric sphincter to relax briefly so that very little amounts of chyme can enter the small intestine. In this way, our stomach empties itself gradually over a period of almost four hours. The small intestine works on a small amount of food at a time. We'll continue to explain the small intestine, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, down to colon and rectum in the next video. Actually, we were told to make this title into two parts so we can publish more. It's a cheat, really. But a new project is kind of refreshing to our animators and designers, giving them some false sense of novelty and freedom. <laughs> so at least we've got that going for us, which is nice. The human heart and its components. The human heart is a hollow, muscular organ situated in the left central of the chest, under the lower third of sternum and between the lungs. The walls of the heart are thick, made up of cardiac muscle. The heart has a double-walled sac, called the pericardium, surrounding it. The space between the heart and the pericardium is filled with fluid. It acts as a lubricant to reduce friction during a heartbeat. The heart is also covered with minute blood vessels. 
The components of the heart and their functions seem very complex at first, but if we follow the blood flow, we will understand what part does what. There are four chambers that work systematically to deliver blood to all cells. Each side has an atrium and a ventricle. The left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the lungs via pulmonary vein and pumps blood to the left ventricle. The mitral valve prevents backflow of blood to the left atrium. The chordae tendinae are tendons that tighten to prevent valves from flapping backwards. The left ventricle pumps oxygenated blood via aorta to all parts of the body except the lungs. The right atrium receives deoxygenated blood and pumps blood to the right ventricle. The tricuspid valve prevents backflow of blood to the right atrium. The right ventricle pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs via pulmonary artery. Here, the semilunar valves prevent backflow of blood. The septum prevents mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. The pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood to the lungs, while the aorta carries oxygenated blood to the body. Can you recall from the previous lesson what the pulmonary vein does? Yes, it carries oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart. The superior vena cava returns deoxygenated blood from head and arms to heart. The inferior vena cava returns deoxygenated blood from lower limbs and organs to the heart. It is important to remember that both the vena cava carry deoxygenated blood and return it to the heart, where the right atrium receives it and thus the cycle continues. Heartbeat. A heartbeat is a heart rhythmic contraction due to the flowing of blood through the heart. Each heartbeat has two phases, diastole and systole. It is a recurrent beat throughout life. During a diastole, the muscles of the atria and ventricle relax. The blood flows into the ventricles. The mitral and tricuspid valves open and semilunar valves close. During an atrial systole, muscles of both atrium contract and both ventricles relax. Again, the blood flows into ventricles. During the ventricular systole, muscles of both the ventricles contract. The blood flows into the pulmonary artery and aorta. The mitral and tricuspid valves close and semilunar valves open. So a heartbeat is composed of a diastole phase, then an atrial systole, a ventricular systole, and back to the diastole and repeat. Nutrition in living organisms. Energy is the ability to do work, to bring about change, or to move anything against opposing force, such as gravity or friction. It is also to maintain a living organism in its highly organized state. Humans and animals get this energy from food. Food contains vital elements that are broken down and gives us energy that is called chemical energy to make new protoplasm for our cells, to ensure reproduction of cells, and to maintain health that is, to prevent deficiency diseases. Different from humans and animals, green plants convert energy from sunlight during photosynthesis. We all have read somewhere or the other that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, but can be converted from one form to another. However, whenever the form of energy is changed, there is some energy lost or wasted in the form of heat energy. Thus, the food must provide more energy than the organism uses to make up for his loss. Energy loss occurs even when the organism is inactive, and this is why even resting organisms require food. Our body is like a machine that wears and tears upon functioning, but unlike any machine, it grows and reproduces. To carry out these processes, it requires food. A classic example of this is that whenever we eat proteins, it is broken down to its simplest form, called amino acids. They are joined together to make proteins for our cell's protoplasm. Besides protein, mammals have to consume certain mineral salts as well as compounds like calcium and phosphorus, which are essential for the formation of skeletal structures. Mammals also need small quantities of vitamins, which they cannot make themselves. For example, if the supply of vitamin D and C is inadequate, they may suffer from deficiency diseases such as rickets and scurvy. Nutrients are chemical substances in foods which nourish the body. There are two types of nutrients, organic and inorganic nutrients. Carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, and dietary fiber are types of organic nutrients because they are obtained from living organisms. Water and mineral salts are inorganic nutrients as they can be obtained from non-living sources. In our next video, we will find out what role each of the nutrients play in our body.
What are polysaccharide and its types? A polysaccharide is formed when many monosaccharide molecules join together. The process of condensing many similar molecules to form a large molecule is identified as polymerization. Condensation is the reaction in which water molecules are released as a byproduct. Starch, cellulose, and glycogen are types of polysaccharides formed from the condensation of many glucose molecules. Starch is one of the most important sources of carbohydrates in our food. It occurs commonly present in vegetable foods such as cereals, potatoes, etc. However, starch is not formed or stored by animals. Starch is made up of a very large number of glucose molecules condensed together to form chains of glucose units. These chains are a composition of straight and branch chains. The glucose units are linked by bridges or chemical bonds, which may contain as many as 200 glucose units. Cellulose is a type of carbohydrate that makes up cell walls of plants. It is similar to starch as it consists of glucose units linked together to form straight chains. Humans cannot digest cellulose, but it forms the bulk of undigested matter, usually consists of fiber. This fiber is important to the proper functioning of the large intestine. Glycogen is sometimes referred to as animal starch. It is a stored form of carbohydrate in animals and also in fungi. In mammals, it is stored mainly in the liver and in the muscles. It is formed when numerous glucose molecules condense to form highly branched chains of glucose units. Glycogen and starch are suitable as storage materials due to many reasons. Some of these are because they are large and insoluble in water, so they do not change osmotic pressure in the cells. Due to their large size, they are unable to diffuse through the cell membrane and can easily be hydrolyzed when needed. What are fats? You may want to get rid of your extra fat because you may think that fats are useless in our body. But the case is otherwise. It is good to get rid of your extra fat, but fat in normal quantities is beneficial for the human body. In fact, not only in humans, but also other mammals like whales. Today, we will find out how fats play a crucial role in the bodies of humans and other mammals. Like carbohydrates, fats are energy-providing foods and are commonly used as food stores, especially by animals. Fats are composed of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. But unlike carbohydrates, fats contain much less oxygen in proportion to hydrogen. Fats can be split into simpler compounds by hydrolysis. When they are hydrolyzed, they yield fatty acids and glycerol. Fats and oils. We call coconut oil an oil, but when we place it in a refrigerator, it soon hardens into a mass of fat. Thus, the difference between fats and oils lies in their state. Fats are solid and oils are liquid at 20 degrees C or room temperature. Here, we shall use the term fat to refer to both solid and liquid animal and vegetable fats. Fats have many functions in the body. To start with, it is an efficient source of storage of energy. It acts as an insulating material present beneath the skin to prevent heat loss. In mammals that live in water, there is a greater tendency to lose heat. Therefore, animals such as whales have a thick layer of blubber beneath the skin, which helps to hold body heat. Sex hormones and other related hormones are made of fats. One of the main compositions of the partially permeable membrane are also fats, which is why the membranes are also called the lipid bilayer. Fats can be classified into two types, saturated and unsaturated fats. The types of fats occurring in animal bodies are called saturated fats. Usually found together with saturated fats is a fatty substance called cholesterol. Cholesterol may get deposited on the inside lining of the arteries and form a plaque. This may cause a heart attack. Fats should also be avoided in the diet of people who have developed gallstones in their gallbladders. Vegetable fats are unsaturated fats. They do not cause heart disease. Therefore, they can be substitutes for animal fats as often as possible. How can I include fats in my diet? Fats can be included in our diets by eating foods like butter, cheese, fatty meat, olives, many nuts and seeds of castor oil, palm oil, and many leguminous plants. Fats are also abundant in the liver of many fish, for example sharks. Humans and other mammals can manufacture their own fat requirements. Thus, fat is not essential in the diet. Similarity between animal and plant cells. Both animal and plant cells are surrounded by a thin, semi-permeable membrane 
called plasma membrane. Surrounding all the organelles is the cytoplasm, a jelly-like substance that covers the whole cell from the plasma membrane to the nucleus. Both plant and animal cells have them. They both also have organelles. Organelles are there to conduct different functions in the cell, same as our organs perform different functions throughout the body. For example, both types of cell have nucleus which can be seen clearly under the light microscope, as it is darkly coloured due to the chromatin material inside it. Chromatin is the genetic material that is made up of loosely coiled threads of DNA. Inside the nucleus, we can see an even deeply coloured stain, and this structure is called the nucleolus, which is made of loops of proteins, DNA and RNA. The mitochondria is a specialised organelle to conduct aerobic respiration. Organelles can also move about, change shape, divide and are abundant in the cell. You see, both the animal and plant cells are such fascinating factories. Differences between animal and plant cells A structure present in animal cells and not in plant cells is the centriole. Under the microscope, centrioles look like small structures close to the nucleus. Plant cells are usually larger than animal cells and are surrounded by a thick, rigid cell wall. This is why they can be seen more easily under a light microscope than an animal cell. The cell wall gives the plant cell a definite shape, preventing the cell from bursting when it enters by osmosis. Plant cells have another interesting structure, the plasmodesmata. The plasmodesmata is like a road connecting a neighbourhood together. Substances sent to neighbouring cells with the help of cytoplasm, which pass through pore-like structures in the cell walls. Plant cells also have large vacuole that covers most of the cell. It is filled with fluid of mineral salts, sugars, oxygen, carbon dioxide and even waste products. Some pigments that give colour to fruits and vegetables are also located in vacuoles. Did you know that the pigment of the red colour of beetroot is also located in vacuoles? In plant cells, the vacuole is also surrounded by a membrane called the tonoplast that controls exchanges between the vacuole and the cytoplasm. Most plant cells also bear chloroplasts that help them carry out the process of photosynthesis. Animal cells do not have this. Every organism needs energy to survive. For human beings, food is the source of energy and it requires oxygen to release this energy. Respiration is the process by which the body obtains and utilizes oxygen to produce energy inside a human's body. There are three steps of respiration in humans. Breathing is the process of moving air into and out of the lungs to facilitate gas exchange with the internal environment. This brings in oxygen from the air and flushes out carbon dioxide. Internal respiration is the exchange of substances between blood and cells whereas cellular respiration is the release of energy from food substances in living cells. Today, we will discuss cellular respiration only. Cellular respiration. There are two kinds of cellular respiration, aerobic and anaerobic. Aerobic respiration is the process by which oxygen-breathing creatures turn fuel, such as fats or sugars, into energy by the help of oxygen. The key organelle inside cells of aerobic respiration is the mitochondria where the glucose molecule from the food goes through a multi-step process, such as glycolysis, Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. At the end of this multi-step process, one molecule of glucose, with the help of six molecules of oxygen, can produce 36 molecules of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, along with six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules. This makes aerobic respiration a very efficient process. All multicellular organisms and some yeast can carry this type of respiration. Aerobic respiration is needed by many processes in our body to run properly. Muscle contraction, such as in limbs, cardiac and peristaltic motion, need the ATP generated through respiration as their fuel. Formation of peptide bonds in protein synthesis, the synthesis of chromosome and cell membranes, cell division in growth, transmission of nerve impulse along the axon by transporting sodium ions in and out of the membrane, and regulation of body temperature are all powered by the aerobic respiration. The examples of anaerobic respiration are alcoholic fermentation, lactic acid fermentation, and process rigorous muscular activity. Alcoholic fermentation is carried out in plants and some yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which sugar is broken down to release energy. 
one molecule of glucose turns into two ethanol, two carbon dioxide, and energy of two ATP is released. This process is an economically important process that is used in bread making and brewing beer and wine. Some bacteria, such as Lactobacillus bulgaricus, cause milk to turn sour and form yogurt. The bacteria feed on sugar, which is then converted into lactic acid and energy. This energy is also equivalent to 2 ATP. The bacteria turn glucose into 2 lactic acid and energy of 2 ATP. In human beings, during strenuous activity, breathing is not able to provide sufficient oxygen for respiration. Muscles experience a shortage of oxygen, so the aerobic process becomes anaerobic. This change causes formation of lactic acid. Accumulation of lactic acid causes muscular cramps and fatigue as a safety measure to protect the muscle cells. Rapid breathing after the activity helps to repay debt by increasing oxygen in the muscles, thus converting the process back to aerobic. Internal respiration. Internal respiration is the exchange of gases between blood and body tissues. It occurs in metabolizing tissues. Like external respiration, internal respiration also happens as simple diffusion because of a partial pressure gradient. However, the partial pressure gradient is the opposite of the gradient in the respiratory membrane. During inspiration, oxygen diffuses across the alveoli and enters into the bloodstream. Around 2% enter the plasma. 98% combine with blood cells to form oxyhemoglobin. In the tissue, the partial pressure of oxygen is only 40 millimeters of mercury because oxygen is used for cellular respiration continuously. Oppositely, the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood is high, about 100 millimeters of mercury. This creates a gradient of pressure that forces oxygen to dissociate from hemoglobin, comes out from the blood, goes across the interstitial space, and goes inside the tissue. Hemoglobin that loses oxygen bonded to it becomes darkened and changes color into burgundy. Because cellular respiration continuously produces carbon dioxide, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is higher in the tissue than in blood, forcing carbon dioxide to diffuse out of the tissue, go across the interstitial fluid, and go inside the blood. Some of them are dissolved in plasma, bound to hemoglobin, or in a converted form. If bound to hemoglobin, carbon dioxide is carried out as carbaminohemoglobin. In converted form, carbon dioxide binds with water to form carbonic acid, and carbonic acid breaks down to release hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. It is then carried back to the lungs. In the lungs, there is a higher concentration of carbon dioxide, and is carried in the blood as bicarbonate ions and carbaminohemoglobin. Carbon dioxide diffuses out of the capillary into the alveoli. During expiration, carbon dioxide is expelled from the lungs. Role of dietary fiber in our diets. Dietary fiber refers to the indigestible fibrous materials in our diets. A good example of this is cellulose that is present in fruits and vegetables. These fibrous materials are important because it provides bulk to the intestinal contents and helps peristalsis. Peristalsis is the contraction and relaxation of muscle on the walls of the digestive tract. Such movements enable food to be mixed with the digestive juices and at the same time move along the digestive canal. With the whole process going so smoothly, it may make you wonder how constipation occurs. Constipation can occur if peristaltic muscles do not move properly. The undigested matter in the large intestine cannot be moved along fast enough, causing an excessive amount of water to be absorbed. As a result, the feces become dry and hard, and the feces removal through excretion becomes difficult. Constipation can be prevented by taking enough fiber and consuming sufficient water. Fresh fruits and vegetables, bran, cereals, whole wheat flatbread and breads are good sources of fibers. Difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Previously, all living organisms were classified into plant and animal kingdom. But it has long been proven that living organisms are far more complex. A common example of it is the existence of microorganisms like parasites, fungi, bacteria, and even viruses that are very different from plants and animals. After the development of molecular biology and the knowledge of genes have increased, Scientists classified the living organisms into two super kingdoms, named prokaryote and eukaryote. The fundamental difference is that prokaryotes, such as bacteria, do not have a nucleus. 
the word pro meaning before, and carrion meaning nucleus. Bacteria are also, on average, about 1 to 10 times smaller in volume than eukaryotes because of the small functions. Their structures are also simple. The genetic material of prokaryotes is present freely in the cytoplasm. Together with few organelles, prokaryotes have slightly smaller ribosomes, about 18 nanometer in diameter, also denoted as 18S. None of the organelles are membrane-bound. Their cell wall functions as a protection from the external environment. The U in eukaryote means true, and carrion, like we mentioned before, means nucleus. So as the name suggests, eukaryotes have a nucleus, or more than one nuclei in their cells, and their genetic material resides inside it. Their ribosomes are slightly larger, about 22 nanometer in diameter, which in most cases is attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is a major organelle that is responsible for protein transportation and synthesizing lipids and some hormones. As eukaryotes are like complex biological factories, many types of cell organelles are present and each is responsible for different functions. Light and electron microscopes. The beauty of biology and all that we know today is due to the invention of microscopes. Microscopes had been available since the beginning of the 17th century, but a lot of improvements were made in the quality of glass lenses in the early 19th century. The branch of biology dealing with microscope design, slide preparation and examination is called cytology. Light microscopy. The light microscope uses light as a source of radiation and has shown us inside cells. It shows us simple structures like the nucleus, the cell wall and the cell membrane. A light microscope is still used in basic studies in schools today. Electron microscopy. Then came the electron microscopes, which made our microscopic world more detailed. Due to the electron microscopes, we not only saw the cell wall, the nucleus and the cytoplasm, but we also saw the more minute organelles like the mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. The light microscopes were doing great. But no matter how much their designs improved, there was an extent to which the light microscopes could not show. Anything smaller than 200 nm could not be seen. Electrons are subatomic particles that have a negative electric charge and are found surrounding the nucleus of an atom, called neutron. When a metal becomes very hot, some of its electrons gain so much energy that they escape from their orbits, like shooting stars. The energy in free electrons is associated with the proportion of waves. The higher the energy, the shorter the wavelength. Electrons are a very suitable form of radiation for a microscope for two major reasons. Firstly, the wavelength is extremely short. And secondly, because they are negatively charged, they can be focused easily using electromagnets. The magnet can be made to alter the path of a beam, similar to how a glass lens made to bend the light. There are two types of electron microscopes in use today. The transmission electron microscope, TEM, and the scanning electron microscope, SEM. In the transmission electron microscope, the beam of electrons is passed through the specimen before being viewed. Only those electrons that are transmitted are seen. This enables us to see different components inside the cells. In a scanning electron microscope, the electron beam is used to scan the surfaces of structures, and only the reflected beam is observed. The advantage of this is that surface structure, for example, like the chintinous outer body of insects, can be seen in great detail. How else do molecules move in and out of cells? Besides diffusion, molecules like nutrients and waste products move in and out of cells through osmosis and active transport. Diffusion is the net movement of ions or molecules, called the solute, from a region where they are higher in concentration to a region where they are lower, that is, down a concentration gradient. Diffusion has been discussed in our video titled, What is Diffusion? Now, we will talk about osmosis. Osmosis is a special type of diffusion that allows the movement of a solvent, mainly water, from a region where it is higher in concentration to a region where it is lower through a partially permeable membrane. The membrane here is the cell surface membrane. The cellulose component of the cell wall makes it permeable and allows most substances to pass through itself. In our daily life, people make use of osmosis principles to preserve foods like pickles or other salted food. 
Salt or sugar is used to lower the concentration of water in the jar or bowl, so the higher water content in the cucumber flows outside. We have covered active transport in our other video, but let's refresh. Sometimes living cells can absorb certain substances even though the concentration of the substances is higher inside the cell than their environment outside. That means it's against the concentration gradient. This process is called active transport and it is possible by spending energy in the form of ATP. Whenever a molecule is passing across the membrane into a higher concentration region, some ATP or adenosine triphosphate is utilized. In living organisms, the flow of some substances depends on active transport. This includes the absorption of dissolved mineral salts by root hair. It is also used in the uptake of glucose and amino acids by the cells in the human small intestine. What are specialized cells and surface area to volume ratio? The cells that make up living things have many different types. They differ in terms of shape and size and are adapted to perform specific functions. Some examples of these cells are the root hair cell, red blood cell and the xylem vessels. Root hair cells are located in plants and are long and narrow in shape. Their specialized cell wall, membrane and vacuole extends to the cell's tail-like protrusion. This tail-like protrusion helps to increase the cell surface area to volume ratio for efficient absorption of water and mineral salts from the soil. The red blood cell in animals contains a red pigment called hemoglobin that enables the cell to transport oxygen from the lungs to all parts of the body. The cells have a circular biconcave shape, which means a narrower inner portion to help increase the cell surface area to volume ratio. Thus, the diffusion of oxygen from and into the cell will be faster. Xylem vessels in plants transport water and mineral salts from the roots to the stem and leaves. They are long, cylindrical and hollow from inside. The vessels lack protoplasm and are dead. This allows water and mineral salts to easily move through the lumen. Lignin is deposited in three different formations, strengthening the walls and preventing the vessel from collapsing. An entire network of xylem vessels is strong enough to mechanically support the plant. Now you may want to ask, what surface area to volume ratio really is? The rate of movement of a substance across a cell membrane depends on how much the cell membrane is actually available. Imagine these two scenarios of people wanting to go inside of two different rooms. The room with a bigger door will fill out much faster. The greater the surface area of the cell membrane, the faster will be the rate of diffusion of a substance for a given concentration gradient. Small cells, like the root and shoot apex, have a higher metabolic rate as they have a small volume and hence small needs, but a greater surface area, which enables the rapid exchange of gases and minerals. As they grow bigger, their metabolic rate slows down as their volume increases will always be much higher than the increase of their surface area. The neighboring cells also develop and surround them, reducing the exposed cell membrane and in turn lowering their surface area to volume ratio further. Vitamins Deficiency diseases such as scurvy and beriberi are caused by the lack of certain chemical substances in our diet known as vitamins. Vitamins are organic compounds that are not built in a definite pattern like carbohydrates, proteins and fats. They are not energy providing foods nor bodybuilding foods. Yet, they are required in small quantities by animals, including humans, for normal health and development. In both underdeveloped countries and developed countries, a deficiency of vitamins can arise. How, you ask? In developed countries, people eat processed foods more and thus, vitamin-rich raw fruits and vegetables are avoided. In underdeveloped countries, people do not get a balanced diet and so are malnourished, resulting in vitamin deficiency. Vitamins can be grouped into two types, fat-soluble and water-soluble. Fat-soluble vitamins, as the name suggests, are soluble in fats and can be stored in the fats of the body. But water-soluble vitamins cannot be stored in the body and need to be supplied in the daily diet. When a particular vitamin is deficient, characteristic symptoms appear. Usually, a mild vitamin deficiency is hard to detect, but it may impair a person's well-being, so he feels run down or irritable. If the deficiency is severe, the particular deficiency disease will develop. As vitamin supplements are becoming easily available over the counter, we must take precaution of the dosage while consuming them. Larger quantities of some vitamins are toxic and may produce mild diseases and should only be taken when prescribed.
Source and functions of vitamins. Vitamin A. Ever heard carrots are good for our eyes? How is that? Carrots are a rich source of vitamin A, a fat-soluble vitamin, and is required for the formation of a light-sensitive pigment in the retina and for maintaining healthy epithelial tissues. Rich sources of these vitamins include dairy products, fish liver oils, and green leafy vegetables. Vitamin B complex. Vitamin B has many subtypes, many of which are important coenzymes in cellular respiration. Beriberi and anemia are deficiency diseases caused by a lack of certain B vitamins. Yeast, liver, and bran are rich sources of the vitamin. Vitamin C, or ascorbic acid. It is a water-soluble vitamin. Vitamin C is needed for the synthesis of intercellular substances. The substances are found between the cells, and they keep the cells together. Vitamin C is also necessary for maintaining healthy epithelial tissues. It is, however, not effective against influenza, according to popular belief. The richest sources of this vitamin are fresh citrus fruits, like oranges and lemons, and some other fruits, like papaya, guava, tomatoes, and bananas. Vitamin C is also found in fresh green vegetables. Fruit juices such as blackcurrant juice and rosehip syrup are often used as convenient sources of this vitamin. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. It promotes the absorption of calcium and phosphorus compounds from the intestines. It also allows the body to use these compounds in the formation of bones and teeth. It is found in fish liver oils like cod and halibut, egg yolk, milk, and margarine. Ultraviolet rays in sunlight can convert a natural substance in the skin to vitamin D. So if a person gets enough sunlight, vitamin D is not needed in the diet. Water and minerals. One of the most important things in our nutrition is not something we eat, but drink. And that thing is water. We can survive up to three weeks without eating, but can survive for only three to four days without water. This is because water is an essential component of protoplasm. About 70% of the body weight of a mammal is water. Functions of water. Water is one of the best known solvents for both inorganic salts and many organic compounds. In fact, it is also known as a universal solvent because of its unique ability to dissolve most of the things that go into it. This property gives water its many functions and makes it especially important to live. Water serves as a medium in which the various chemical reactions of an organism occur. It is an important component of the blood that helps the transportation of digested food substances from the intestines to other parts of the body. The transportation of excretory products from the tissue cells to excretory organs, such as kidneys, for removal, and the transportation of hormones from glands, where they are produced, to regions of the body which require them. It is also a major component of lubricant found in the joints and the digestive juices. In addition, water is needed to carry out many types of hydrolytic reactions, which take place during digestion. It is also required in homeostasis to maintain our body temperature and by plants during photosynthesis. Water requirements. The amount of water needed in the body depends on the activity of the person and the environmental conditions. Water is lost from the body during many of our daily activities, which are as simple as breathing, excreting, and sweating. More exercises mean more sweat and more water loss. In some diseases like diabetes, the amount of urine excreted is increasing significantly, so the patients need more water than people without diabetes. To balance the amount of water lost daily, a normal, healthy, and ordinarily active adult in a temperate climate requires about 3 litres of water a day. In hot climates, slightly more water may be needed. Minerals Mineral elements are inorganic salts that do not provide energy, but are vital for the proper functioning of our bodies. Minerals are obtained from other animals or plants. In humans and other mammals, some minerals are acquired in large amounts, while others are only needed in small amounts. The minerals that are needed in large quantities are calcium, phosphorus, sodium, chlorine, potassium, and iron. Today, we will discuss important minerals such as calcium and iron. Calcium. Calcium is mainly found in dairy products like milk, cheese, and eggs. Calcium is also available in soya beans, cereals, and dark green vegetables like spinach. Calcium is required for the building of bones and teeth. It is also needed for the normal functioning of the muscles and for the clotting of blood to prevent excessive loss of blood. Iron. Iron is found in the liver, all red meat, and egg yolk. 
It is also found in bread, flour, and dark green vegetables. Iron is a structural component of hemoglobin, myoglobin, and some enzymes, and so is essential for their formation. Trace elements. Minerals known to be needed in very small quantities are called trace elements. Iodine, zinc, and manganese are examples of such elements. Trace elements are normally consumed in food, and they function in various bodily processes. Food deficiency disease. Starvation, malnutrition, and overnutrition are some of the main food supply-related problems our world faces today. This is due to the increasing population, unequal distribution of food, and the growing of cash crops instead of food in some developing countries. Starvation occurs when a human or another mammal does not receive enough energy in their diet. Therefore, to meet metabolic needs, the body starts to use stored fats and glycogen. When these are gone, the body starts to use available protein, and so our muscles are utilized. Our heart is also a muscle, and thus, this may seriously weaken our heart. Malnutrition is a little different from starvation, because malnutrition results from dietary imbalance. It may be due to an excess intake of nutrients over a period of time, or deficiency. Deficiency diseases also occur due to a lack of vitamins and minerals. We have discussed them in our previous videos. We now also know that a lack of dietary fiber results in constipation. Overnutrition occurs when a person consumes more energy than he or she can use up, so he becomes fat. Such a person is said to be obese, and this is one of the most common problems in developed countries. One of the main problems is the overconsumption of saturated fats and cholesterol, which increases the risk of coronary heart disease. This is dangerous because it has been estimated that on average, every 500 grams of fatty tissue requires a kilometer long supply of blood vessels. More blood vessels to cover all the extra fat cells would mean our heart must beat many times more for the blood to reach the new vessels and regulate the cells. To conclude, dietary imbalance may be due to economic constraints, poor eating habits, and unwillingness to follow nutritional guidelines. So next time, if you have a problem with your weight, do visit a nutritionist and get yourself a balanced diet plan. Carbohydrates and its types. We encounter many types of carbohydrates in our daily lives, from bread to rice and even to cellulose in our clothes. Carbohydrates mainly come from plants and are a good source of energy for the body. They also function as supporting structures, like, for example, cellulose cell walls in plants. They are used to make other organic compounds like amino acids and fats. Nucleic acids like DNA are also formed by carbohydrates, as well as lubricants like mucus. Another fascinating function of carbohydrates is that they are also used to produce the nectar in some flowers. Carbohydrates are organic compounds made up of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen and oxygen atoms are present in the same ratio, that is, 2 to 1. There are three main types of carbohydrates, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Monosaccharides have a simple chemical composition, and therefore known as simple sugars. Examples of them are glucose, fructose, and galactose. The sugar glucose is one of the simplest forms of sugars and has the chemical formula C6H12O6. The generalized formula for carbohydrates is CnH2MOM. In the case of glucose, N and M is equal to 6. Disaccharides are also known as complex sugars, as they have complex chemical compositions. Maltose, lactose and sucrose are their examples. Disaccharide structure molecules are made up of two molecules of simple sugars, condensed together. The most common types of disaccharides have 12 carbon atoms with the general formula C12H22O11. The differences in the disaccharides are again due to the different atomic arrangements within the molecule. Sucrose, or cane sugar, occurs in sugar cane stems, sweet fruits, and certain storage roots, for example, carrots. It consists of a glucose and a fructose molecule combined together. Lactose, also known as milk sugar, is commonly found in milk, as the name suggests. It is found in milk of all mammals, including humans, and even in some similar fluids, such as pigeon's milk. It is formed from glucose and galactose combined together. 
maltose, known as malt sugar, is present in malted cereals and sprouting grains. It is formed from the partial digestion of starch and is a combination of two glucose molecules. As mentioned before, the formulation of one molecule of disaccharide requires two molecules of simple sugars. Each reaction is known as condensation reaction. Condensation is a chemical reaction whereby two simple molecules are joined together to form a larger molecule with the removal of one molecule of water. On the other hand, when a disaccharide is treated with a suitable enzyme, it breaks down to form monosaccharides. In this reaction, water is added and thus the reaction is called hydrolysis or hydrolytic reaction. Polysaccharides are the most chemically complex carbohydrate and its examples include starch and cellulose. There are other substances which are slightly modified carbohydrates, such as the chitin of the arthropod skeleton. Do you have a balanced diet? This is very difficult to determine, as it is very complex to find out. A balanced diet contains the right amount of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, water and dietary fibre to make the daily requirements of the body. Every one of us requires different nutrients and this depends on our lifestyle, activities and age. This is why a balanced diet for one person may not be a balanced diet for another. Balanced diet provides the energy to survive and stay healthy. Energy is needed to do work while we are awake and to perform activities when we are at rest or asleep. The amount of energy needed to carry on vital processes of the body when it is in complete rest is known as basal metabolism, where metabolism is the chemical reactions that take place within our bodies. The basal metabolic rate is a measure of how fast chemical reactions are occurring when a person is completely at rest. For example, the energy required in the beating of the heart. Basal metabolic rate is affected by climate, body size, age, sex and health of an individual. Climate. A person living in a cold country tends to lose more heat in his surroundings and uses more energy in order to maintain his body temperature. Thus, his basal metabolic rate is higher than that of a person living in the tropics. Body size. People of the same sex and age may have different body size and weights. It is estimated that those with a bigger build require more energy than those with a smaller build. Age. Growing children normally have a higher basal metabolic rate than older people because they require more energy for growth. In adults, the basal metabolic rate tends to decrease slowly throughout life. Sex. Men normally have a higher heat production than women of the same body size and age, which requires more energy, as men usually have a smaller amount of fatty tissue in their bodies. Thus, the prevention of heat loss is less efficient in men than in women. Health. The thyroid gland in the neck controls the metabolic rate by secreting a hormone called thyroxine. If someone has an underactive thyroid, it results in insufficient thyroxine and thus lowering the metabolic rate. Overactive thyroid produces more thyroxine, resulting in a higher metabolic rate. Activity. If someone is very active and does heavy work, he or she needs more energy per day than a person who is moderately active.